started. Uh, welcome to our program tonight about rock carvings along Chicago's waterfront with Mr. William Swislow. Um, my name is Grace Hayek, and this is coming to you from the Glencoe Public Library. Um, I want to take care of a little business at the front end here. Um, we do offer closed captioning. If anybody wants it, you have to request it. And, and if you want to request it, please put mention it in the chat and I will turn the closed captioning on. Um, it turns it on for everyone if I do that. And so what you have to do if you don't want to see the captions is to opt out. Um, to opt out, you go to, to the bottom of your screen and select live transcript and then hide subtitles and that should hide them for you if you don't want to see them. Um, so if anyone wants close captioning, please let me know in the chat. Uh, Q&A, uh, we will be happy to have questions um, uh, and Mr. Mr. Swisslow will run through his presentation first and then if you put your questions into Q&A or chat, I would be happy to ask them on your behalf. We are recording tonight's program, so um, if you miss part of it or if you wish to send a copy of it to somebody, a link to it um, to someone else, you can do that. It'll be on the library's YouTube channel starting probably Monday morning. Um, I'm going to run a very brief poll now to ask how many people are watching, so if you wouldn't mind. And finally, I'm going to introduce our presenter. We are very pleased to welcome back Mr. Swislow, who presented a fantastic program on Outside Your Art at this library a few years ago. A founder and longtime executive of cars.com, Mr. Swislow is now a digital media, digital media consultant, writer, art collector, and operator of the cultural website interestingideas.com. I will put that in the website, in, in the chat, because I'm sure it is indeed very interesting. He sits on the boards of the gallery Intuit, the Center for Intuitive and Outsider Art in Chicago, and the Society for Commercial Archaeology. Before joining cars.com, Bill worked at the Chicago Tribune and other media organizations. He's written extensively on various subjects relating to self-taught and outsider art, and is the author of the forthcoming book, Lakefront Anonymous, Chicago's Unknown Art Gallery. And we are about to get a sneak preview of that with this program. So um, I will hand this over to you, Bill. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, well, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, it feels a little sad that we're staring at our screens rather than hanging out at the lake, but um, so it goes. But my, my hope is that um, I'm going to show you what you might see, at least in the Chicago lakefront, if you look down the next time you're there. Um, so much of the lakefront in Chicago is lined with limestone blocks that were put in place starting about 100 years ago to protect the shoreline from the water. This, this, these blocks here is, are typical of what they look like. This is at Promontory Point in Hyde Park, which we'll talk about some more a little later on in the presentation. Uh, these blocks were a place where people have come to play, uh, again, for about 100 years, whether they were strolling or swimming or just hanging out. This is near Promontory Point, just north of it in Hyde Park. Um, and some of the people who, who were spending time on those blocks left behind a legacy. And many of those blocks are lined with carvings like the one you can see here, which is also in Hyde Park uh, at, a, at a place called Morgan Shoal. To me, this, as I saw more and more of these carvings, it seems to me that this is really a kind of an art gallery or a social history of the millions of people who have spent time on the lakefront. And I think collectively, it's sort of a monument to those same millions of people who've enjoyed the lakefront in Chicago. Um, we'll talk about how many there are right now, because there's thousands of stone carvings um, uh, that people like, if you look at this carving, Chris or Mike or Ed or Chaz, and you know, there's many other names on this particular rock uh, left you know, this sort of legacy behind. And these carvings stretch from the Indiana state line at Calumet Beach Park, which, which uh, goes right down to Indiana, all the way up to Kathy Osterman Beach on the north side of Chicago at Hollywood Avenue. Because um, these were all, there, there, was the, there were these limestone blocks all the way along. The key point uh, that I want you to take away from this is this idea, is the idea that's important to me that carvings, these carvings show that art can be found anywhere, you know, not just in institutions, not just in sanctioned venues. 
Um, and a lot of the art that you can find along the, rake, the lakefront is pretty wonderfully creative, like this mermaid uh, carving here, which is sort of this delicate figure that's sitting at Foster Avenue Beach. We'll also talk a lot about Foster Avenue Beach as time goes on. But these carvings can be hard to see. That's an image of the same mermaid, but you know more. that's more of what you would see if you were just walking by, and the likelihood is you wouldn't see it. Um, and in fact, as a result, many of the, the existence of these carvings is actually very little known. Um, I'm, I've been surprised in the years I've been documenting and photographing and talking about them, how many people tell me I spend all, all this time on the lakefront and I have never noticed these carvings. Um, they are very rarely written about, very rarely heard about. I found them because uh, a friend of mine had discovered them in the late 80s and told me about them. Ultimately, uh, Aaron Packer, my friend, worked with me on the book that uh, uh, I'll talk about a little bit at the end. Um, he, he wrote about the carvings in the early 90s. He actually had an exhibit of his photos at the cultural, Chicago Cultural Center in 1992 and got a little attention for the carvings, but then uh, it's basically radio silence with a couple of exceptions uh, in the year since. But if you look around when you're on the lakefront in Chicago, you might see something like Abe Lincoln here, who's at Foster Avenue Beach, just north of the beach. Um, if you look down, you could see a carving of a foot. There's a few of these, believe it or not. This one's at Rainbow Beach, which is roughly at 75th Street on the south side. You might see a hand like this one that's carved on the rocks at Foster Beach. Or you might see a lion also at Foster, north of Foster Beach. This lion is particularly interesting because if you look at the lion, You'll see on the left, there's a stone, there's a carved lion, although usually when people paint over these carvings, I get annoyed, it's sort of vandalism. But whoever painted this lion actually gave it a body. So the, the carvings on the left, the block on the right has sort of a Jackson Pollock effect body and a tail. So they completed the, the lion and, and, and sort of made the lion whole. So in this case, it's not really vandalism, it's sort of a creative extension of the original carving. And you'll see that now and again around the lakefront where where people add on. Um, there's animals. This is a beautiful horse also around near Foster Avenue Beach. Very, you can see very nicely detailed. And there's lots of faces. Um, this one's particularly stunning. Uh, it's near the, if you're familiar at all with the uh, Montrose, dog, Montrose Beach Dog Park, this is near the dog park. It's often covered up with, sta with sand, but when it's not, it, it's, it's, it's quite striking. Um, and the sand probably actually has kept it protected, uh, which is why it's so sharp. You know, near that one, there's this portrait. Again, one of many, many portraits. I like to think of this as John Malkovich, although, you know, no reason to believe it was intended that way, but that's certainly who it reminds me of. Um, you might see, you see lots of names, actually, many names, many initials of the thousands of carvings. And I've, taken photographs of literally thousands of them. The majority of them are names and initials. In this case, you can see Bill Adler. Uh, this is in Hyde Park at Morgan Shoal. He did a great job with this typography. And then below it, a double heart with a little arrow running through the heart. This is um, behind La Rabita Hospital at around 65th Street in the lake. Um, a very nice carving. But uh, one of the points is when I talk about like Morgan Shoal where Bill Adler is or La Robita Hospital, those are representative of areas where there are big concentrations of rocks, of carvings, I mean. Um, uh, unfortunately, those two locations are kind of hard to get to. Uh, you have to scramble and climb over a lot of uh, topsy-turvy rocks to get there. And we'll see a couple of, an example of that a little later. Foster Beach is one of the big concentrations of carvings. And it's also one that's actually quite accessible and, and, and in great shape. Um, so this, this photo here is showing about half of the 20 limestone blocks on the north end of Foster Avenue Beach. And they host about 30 stone carvings just on those 20 rocks. You know, there's dozens more north and south of the beach, but, but just this one strip of rocks is a, was a hotbed of creativity. So that's that hand that we saw. This is one of my all time favorite carvings. There's a number of what, what I call bathing beauties up and down the shoreline in Chicago. Um, this, is, uh, this is a very sweet and charming one that's at Foster Avenue Beach. It's actually quite small. Yeah, someone's asking if it's illegal to carve on the lakefront stones. I'll, I'll answer that one on the fly right now because it is a common uh, 
question. Uh, I, I am sure that technically it is. Um, I've talked to actual carvers, and we'll I'll talk about that a little later. Um, and none of them ever had issues with with police. I don't think the police really care. Um, but not a lot of people are carving anymore, anyways. Uh, spray paint is much more common than than uh, carving, but so it goes. Um, this is another Foster Beach example. You know, a key point here is that is that you know these are vast majority of these are anonymous. You know, they weren't made for no one was paying anyone to make them. Uh, you know, no one was getting famous making these carvings. Uh, yeah, they could be remarkably complex and subtle. So like this, this little shield at Foster Beach on those 20 rocks I mentioned, you can see there's a couple of fish on the left, the date 1958. I think that's a sheaf of wheat on the upper right. And then a squirrel appears to be eating an acorn. Now that's, that's, that's a pretty subtle bit of stone carving. Not so subtle as this sort of pirate face, which is you know very close to what we just saw at Foster Beach. Or, you know, this really interesting complex um, uh, set of a triptych of carvings, uh, same location, we're still at Foster Beach. Uh, and there's some meaning to this, although it can be a little cryptic. Um, these three carvings are probably by different hands at different times, hard to tell. Uh, but also to give you a sense of scale here, this rock is probably about eight feet wide. Um, that's, that's typically what, uh, 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 the width of these limestone blocks are quite massive. Um, some of them are even wider in some parts of the lakefront go, are even wider than eight feet, but this one's probably about eight feet. But, you know, again, this is the three pieces of this triptych. There's this really interesting image of a television set with Nixon and this dollar sign underneath. Um, I was telling someone that young people aren't going to necessarily recognize this as a TV set in the future because they won't know that that's a TV antenna on top of it. But uh, I think a lot of us are probably old enough to remember that that's what TV sets used to look like. Uh, next to the TV set is this, you know, the crosses of Calvary under which someone, probably not the carver of the crosses, wrote dead haha. -ha. You know, there's a, so there's sort of a, a cognitive dissonance or something there in, in that carving. And then right next to that is this really realistic, beautiful fish. So um, it gives you a, a taste of both the talents of these carvers, but also the fact that there's there's some meaning to them that they're not they're not purely decorative. But speaking of decorative, so one of the, the interesting things about Foster Beach, hope you can hear me over Travolta, Olivia, and John. Um, I'll let this play out. Give me one second. So, okay, so. Um, Jim Jacobs was the playwright of Greece, which was a play that was written in, in Chicago about kids from Taft High School. Where do those kids hung, hung out, hang out? Among other places at Foster Avenue Beach. And in fact, the original version of that song, Summer Nights, which became a huge hit, was a song called Foster Beach, which was in the original play. When the play went to Broadway, of course, who knew what Foster Beach was, so they dropped it. Um, but that's where Jim Jacobs, who's in this picture, this is a picture of Jim Jacobs from 1960, hanging out on the rocks at Foster Beach. Um, and best of all, for my purposes, the, the song Foster Beach includes these lyrics about painting a summer souvenir at, uh, on the rocks at Foster Beach. You can see a big red heart with two names inside. Um, now, this happens to be at Foster Beach, Pat and Jim, but I think it's wishful thinking for me to believe that, that that's what the song was alluding to, but you know, I like to think so. But anyways, uh, just very interesting that where these carvings are is also was one of the sources for Greece. Um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, this rock is, is right there at Foster Beach. And in fact, I, I have reason to believe there's a fair chance that that picture I showed of Jim Jacobs was actually literally in front of this rock. This rock itself is interesting. There's about 40 names on this rock. Could they be characters, people who eventually wound up as characters in Greece? Again, wishful thinking. But the rock has 1961 carved into it. Um, so who knows? But the key point, Greece aside, is, is that all these people, Sid and Otto and Mo and... Uh, Doc and, you know, all of them, Vic, are effectively anonymous. We know first names and that's it. Um, 
you know, the fact is that most of these carvers, you know, did not consider themselves artists or what they were doing art. It was just a way to pass the time. You know, they, they weren't doing this, as I said before, to be famous. So um, although, as we'll see, a few, a few carvers did uh, leave us their last names. There's, in fact, a couple carvings with last names and addresses. But um, so it goes. But these traces of identity can really be found all the way up and down the lakefront. Um, this is an image from Rainbow Beach on the south side, and there are many there. One of my favorites is this one. These rocks have shifted, but when, when I put them together, um, th these rocks were carved by a gentleman named Hal Martin Graybow. Um, and you can see underneath his name, 53, 4, 5. So those are the years. Uh, you can see sort of on the, on the center upper middle, it says Knox College. Then it says Ginny Daniel, who was probably a girlfriend. She was a Tri-Delta, presumably. Hal was in the Navy. It says USN and Phi, Phi Gamma Delta. Um, so he carved this in the mid-1950s at Rainbow Beach. And there is Hal. Um, actually, with another carving on the far end of the beach from the first one that also, it's hard to read here, but it has the same, say, Hal Martin Graybow, Ginny Daniel, Knox College. Uh, he did indeed go to Knox College. He did indeed join the Navy. Um, he ended up as a part-time police officer in Walworth County, Wisconsin, married Betty Hartzell in 1977, survived by one of three sons from an earlier marriage, blah, blah, so on and so forth. Importantly, he was a lifeguard and he's memorialized at, he memorialized himself and still is memorialized at Rainbow Beach. Um, how do I know he was a lifeguard? Because of the gentleman who carved this rock. If you can, you can see at the top, it says Buzz Zingaro. And then underneath it, 1963 through, through 1968, he was a lifeguard for all those years. He was, went to Leo High School in Chicago and went on to be a teacher. I talked to Buzz. Uh, it's helpful when these carvers have, in, have kind of different last names because it makes it possible for me to track them down. Um, at least a few of them. Buzz told me we had some hammers and chisels that we'd trade around and whoever was working that day would carve their name. So the lifeguards would, when they had downtime, pass the time partly by carving their names and their girlfriends' names into the rocks. And in fact, Buzz did exactly that. At the bottom of this rock here, from the, again, this is actually on the far side of Rainbow Beach, you can see there's a, here's the detail, Kathy and Buzz with a, in a little sort of broken heart. I mean, the heart was probably intact when he carved it. The sweet thing is that Kathy and Buzz are still together today, um, you know, uh, uh, more than half a century later. So nice story. You know, another Rainbow Beach artist was a gentleman named Guy, Guy Lazara, who lives in the Chicago south, Southwest suburbs. In the 1950s, he was a steel worker. And he told me he went to Rainbow Beach just to get away, you know, and he, you know, had nothing better to do. So he did this carving. Um, he put in his name, he put in his birthday, uh, and he, he carved a self-portrait. And he said, I did that without a picture, just by measuring with fingers, he told me. You know, he never became an artist after this. This was just a one-off thing he did. He said, I was just doing my own thing. And when I was doing it, no one was paying attention to what I was doing. So um, that's, that's, uh, that's the gentleman. He told me it was vandalized not long after he carved it. And you can kind of see the, the damage to the, to the profile, but um, you know, still recognizably a young man. So, so Guy left a, a little monument to himself there at Rainbow Beach in the, again, this would be in the mid 1950s. You know, a few more carvers that I've been able to identify. And believe me, these are the exceptions. The vast majority of carvers are completely anonymous, but Bob, Bob Nactree, again, a, Kind of an odd name, so I tracked him down in Joliet, where he, he's living today. Um, he was a freshman at the University of Chicago. With he had a friend, Cliff Weaver, and he told me early, early, like at four in the morning in the late spring of 1964, they took hammers and chisels that belonged to Bob's father, and they went to Promontory Point and they carved their names and their girlfriends' names on the rocks. He said it took several hours. They were stopped by a cop on the way there, but when they explained what they were doing, the cop just, you know, I, sounds like just kind of laughed at them and let them move move along. So there's 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 Linda Turner and Bob Nactreeb and Clifford Weaver and Donna Florence. Um, Bob wound up in the Foreign Service. Cliff was a prominent zoning lawyer in Chicago. Um, 
And they're both married to the girls whose names they carved, still married, carved in 1964 in the rocks of Promontory Point. Now, I tracked these guys down, but they've never gotten any recognition. One carver of all the carvers of all those thousands of carvings on the lakefront has gotten recognition, and it's for this carving, which is a, a large scale mermaid. As I said, these blocks are about six feet wide. So, so that's like a life size figure of a, of a mermaid. Uh, the carver is a, the main carver was a, is a gentleman named Roman Villarreal, who is a former steel worker and a self taught stone carver. And in 1968, with some friends, he carved this mermaid um, actually at 39th Street, but it's since been moved away from the lakefront. And it's sitting at the southern end of Oakwood Beach, which is about, this is probably about 43rd Street or thereabouts uh, on the south side. But it's a lovely carving. Uh, things happen, though. And this is, this is, this is, from, this picture's from a year or two ago. This picture's from today. So someone or something has tipped the mermaid over, which is, quite a undertaking since um, these, these are very heavy, solid blocks of limestone, but somehow the mermaid got tipped over. In any case, it's a really beautiful carving, um, but until 2000, no one knew who made it. And, and it had been written up in a couple places as the mystery mermaid. And in fact, in 2000, the Chicago Sun-Times wrote a story about the mystery of the mermaid. And like, where did this come from? Well, Roman's daughter, who was the model for the mermaid, saw the story and contacted the Sun Times. And the Sun Times, you know, covered it. Um, you can kind of see the original location in the in the left, and you can see the guys working on it on the right. So, so they tracked down Roman, interviewed Roman, and, and I guess eventually People Magazine did a little item on, on the mermaid. But Roman has since been come a, has been a prolific artist. He paints and he carves. He actually has work, limestone work in a number of parks around Chicago, as well as some, some other works in other media as well. Um, there's Roman today. He's got a studio in South Chicago. It's almost under the Skyway, but you can see a couple of his uh, more recent limestone carvings there. Um, but these guys I just talked about are really the exceptions. Uh, uh, for the most part, even, even the carvings that are signed and dated remain anonymous. So here you have a uh, a, a interesting fish card, you know, card with a with a built-in frame. Uh, this is also near Foster Beach, carved in 1958 by G A R. You know, no idea who G A R is. The 1958 is significant mostly because that's when Foster Foster Avenue Beach did not exist until 1958. Um, it was built when Lakeshore Drive was extended north of Foster Avenue. They they created a, a park. Uh, and, and and a new and a couple new beaches north of Foster. It's one of the reasons why the famous Edgewater Beach Hotel went out of business because after they extended Lakeshore Drive and put in landfill to the east of it, Edgewater Beach Hotel, which was a famous hotel um, just north of Foster Avenue, uh, was no longer by the edge of the water, and that that certainly did not help its cause. But but this is uh, you know. Beautiful carving, signed, dated, but we don't know who, we don't know anything about who created it. And in fact, that also applies to what is the largest group of carvings by a single person that I've been able to identify. And this is an example of one of them. These are men, not all of them, but many of them are signed and dated, but they're signed and dated with initials. But there's about a dozen of dozen carvings that are clearly by the same person north and south of Foster Beach. I actually saw this gentleman carving. Uh, one of these pieces in the mid-1990s. Um, I did not have the presence of mind at that time to chat with them because I, at that point, I was sort of, my interest in these carvings was much more casual. Um, but he was using base, he was Hispanic, using basic hand tools like a hammer and maybe a chisel, maybe a sharpened nail. I don't, I don't remember exactly. But all of his carvings have these sort of Mesoamerican themes. And in fact, with the help of a, of, a, of a friend, I've been able to identify the sources for a handful of them are, are, are literally copies of, of carvings from Mayan ruins, this one being an example. This also shows that these carvings are very complicated. This carver really did incredibly complicated work, um, you know, just on his own, you know, without, without help as far as I could tell and without any support. Um, and it can be hard to read the images in these, even, even when you're looking at them in person. It can be hard to like, like, like figure out what all these, these things are. But 
I can tell you that this particular carving is a bird deity from, from a tablet in the ruins at Palenque. And you can see a drawing uh, of this exact figure uh, and then the carving at Foster Beach underneath. So, I mean, he took liberties, but you can see that the carving is clearly based on this other car. There's a carving that's, that's clearly an image of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, there's a carving that, that is, a, is, you know, that is essentially uh, inspired by a, a particular carving at Chichen Itza. Um, so, and there, there you can see the, the whole context of that, that original in Palenque, and it's part of a much more elaborate carving that our carver certainly did not have room to reproduce on the rocks at Foster Beach, but he reproduced a nice detail from it. So those are symbols of a kind, and there are lots of symbols along carved into the lakefront. You know, here's the male-female symbols. These are in this Morgan Shoal area, which is around 49th Street in Hyde Park. Um, there is a handful of these uh, iron cross, Maltese crosses around. Um, there's actually a few swastikas to be seen, although not, not too many, not too many. It uh, could, be, could be a lot worse uh, as far as that. There's a, there, there's a handful of kind of hateful carvings that I've come across. The worst is actually near this iron cross at, at behind La Rabita Hospital. There's actually a rock that has carved into it reserved for white people. That's probably the, the, the ugliest, nastiest carving I found. Although there are a couple carvings that, that, that based on current standards would be considered uh, racist caricatures that also are out there. Uh, but for the most part, what you see instead of hateful things, uh, the most common symbols along the lakefront are peace symbols. And there's probably at least a dozen of peace symbols, various sites. And there probably used to be more, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but this rock is, to me, encapsulates the whole hippie summer of love, 1967-68 uh, uh -huh moment. You can see there's a, a peace symbol in the middle. The word peace is written, the peace sign with the fingers. But uh, there's also flowers. There are butterflies, if you look carefully. And if you look on the left, there's a bare foot. So it's that whole, it's just, it's just the whole hippie package right there on run, one rock behind La Rabita Hospital and still there today. Not that easy to get to, unfortunately, because the rocks there, you can kind of see uh, how they're, they're not really, you know, well, uh, or they're not orderly back there. Um, this is another peace symbol, I think beautifully carved. You know, it's probably the finest of the peace symbol carvings I've come across. This is at Fullerton Avenue in the lake. And this one's very easy to find uh, because it's right next to a theater on the lake and it's totally accessible. Um, it's actually in the same area as these figures, um, which uh, I call the hair washers, or someone suggested that as, as the name. Uh, um, so these, these, at, these are at Fullerton Avenue, where the boulders were installed early in the process in 1925 and then torn out in 2015 as part of the Lakefront Protection Project, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, in this case, unlike most of the places where they tore out, where they've torn out these, these old rocks, um, there was a land, this is where they actually added some landfill and added some park to Lincoln Park in around 2015 or 20, in 2016. And they had a landscape architect on that pro project who was aware of the carvings and got them to save as many of them as they could. And she then repurposed them into seating areas and then decorative elements in the new park. So this is part of a, of a very lovely seating area, which I'll show you the seating area in a minute. This is actually in the same on in that same seating area as the peace sign and the hair washers, these sort of Egyptian themed uh, figures that someone carved. They're in beautiful condition, um, as are these, which are nearby, some more Egyptian themed carvings. And then there are these Easter Island kind of tiki carvings that are also in the same area around the theater on the lake there. That's that seating area, the hair washers, you can see in the bottom left. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to identify them. The P sign is to the right off screen. And I think the Egypt, some of the Egyptian stuff is to the left. Um, but one of the main things to, to, to understand about this is that, that this extravaganza of, sto of stone carving is really a triumph of what I consider this Chicago's greatest cultural achievement which is that its lakeshore was preserved free from industrial and commercial use. Um, that's not typical. You don't typically find a city, at least until recent years, when a lot of places have deindustrialized, where their waterfront is, is basically parkland almost the full length. Um, 
because of that, and because of this particular approach they took using these limestone blocks to protect the shoreline, we have all these carvings. I, 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 I wish I could say I've walked waterfronts everywhere in the world, uh, unfortunately not, but to the extent I've been able to do research, I haven't found any city with anything close to what Chicago has in terms of these carvings. You know, I found pictures of Barcelona in Spain where there's a handful of, or Catalonia, I should say, where there's a handful of carvings along the beach, but nothing like the volume here. I mean, the closest analogs to the Chicago carvings to me are the ancient petroglyphs of the Southwest, American Southwest of Hawaii, and the Abor there are Aboriginal carvings around Sydney. You know, in these cases, some of these carvings are pretty close to urban areas. Carvings, of course, in Chicago are modern, and they line one of the most popular stretches of real estate in the world, which makes them unique. Now, that cultural achievement I talked about didn't just happen. Um, uh, there, was, there was some luck, and then there was a lot of effort. Um, arguably, it started in 1836 when the state of Illinois sent commissioners to map Chicago before Chicago was even a city. And they wrote on that map, as you can read on the bottom, this is a common, this is on the lakefront, a common to remain open, clear, and free of any buildings or other obstructions whatsoever. Um, so that sort of set a principle that the lakefront was not to be built on or industrialized. Now, what made a big difference was that Montgomery Ward, the, the retailer, um, had his offices on Michigan Avenue across from what is now Grant Park in the early 1900s, around the turn of the century, and he did not want his view to be obstructed, and he was litigious. So he fought and, and litigated to prevent anything more that than was already there, like the Art Institute was already there, being built on the lakefront. And others fought similar battles afterwards. And as a result, that's why Chicago's shoreline is sort of free of obstructions and was available um, for these carvings to be made. Um, but, you know, and, and they didn't win every battle. Special interests have tried over the century to, to build on the lakefront. They did get McCormick Place built, but they didn't get more recently the George Lucas Museum built. Uh, but the real enemy is not the special interest, the enemy of what's on the shore, but the lake itself. And there is a long history of storm damage and flooding, which is why these rocks were put in place. So this is from 1901, uh, you know, Lake Michigan's relentless waves. 1972, I mean, excuse me, 1917, the shoreline being ripped up by a, a storm. 1929, another storm, another flood along lakes or along the lakefront uh, in Lincoln Park. 2020, the same story. Of course, people believe that, that um, climate change is gonna make it worse and I'm sure that they are correct. Um, so it's still going on. Um, so these rocks have taken a beating. Now, as I said, these rocks were, were laid, first laid probably in the early 19, mid, mid 1920s, maybe a little earlier. And they were laid to, they were put out there to armor the shore against flood and erosions. You know, one reason they're needed is because the Chicago shoreline is not supposed to be there. I mean, as mo some people are aware, but not everyone, almost the entire shoreline of Chicago is artificial. It, it's landfill, you know, from, from Indiana all the way up to the north side. Uh, it, it was the, the city built out into the lake. And, and, and so, of course, you know, as is often the case when we build on waterfronts, uh, we have to take extraordinary measures to pre preserve them from the water. And that's what these rocks were about. This is, these are rocks being put into place somewhere near Waveland Avenue in probably in the 1930s. Um, the photo's undated, but it kind of shows how they constructed and how orderly these were. But after decades and decades of pounding, this is an example of what happens and what has happened. This is Diversity Har Harbor, probably around 2003. This is no longer there as we'll see in a minute, but you can see how these rocks uh, took a beating and eventually started falling into the lake, partly because they were built on these wooden foundations. And when the water levels were low, um, many years after they were built, uh, exposed the wood and the wood rotted and the foundation started getting undermined. And you, as a result, you get to this. And it's, it's an issue and it's still an issue in, in, in parts of uh, the lakefront, particularly on the south side around Promontory Point and that Morgan Shoal area. So in the 2000s, after years of planning, the city and the Army Corps of Engineers undertook a project 
to do something about this because you know the, the, the issues being erosion and flooding, unfortunately, they did not care so much about preservation of what was there and the beauty of what was there. So this is another shot of that area um, around Diversity Harbor. This is between Belmont and Diversity. Um, and this was an area that was known, was a very actually quite famous in its day as the rocks. It was a very major uh, hangout for gay, for gay people, hung out here, uh, very popular, um, but this is all gone. And now it's this. Um, the Army Corps basically ripped out the rocks and replaced this with concrete and steel. Um, some people would consider the concrete and steel much tidier and much nicer. Other people think it, believe it's rather sterile and uninviting, but in any case, it lost the historic character. In this case, they actually saved a few rocks and you can see them lining the top of, of the concrete. There's a, there's a strip of rocks, you know, the thousands of rocks that were here, they saved, I think I counted them. I think there's like 200 or 300. That, that line there. And a few of them, as we'll see, actually have some interesting stuff on them. But, but the key point here is that um, about half of these limestone rocks that we're talking about were torn out uh, during this project in the 2000s. Um, and so half of them are basically gone along with the carvings that were on them. Very few carvings were saved. There were a handful, like here, there's a handful, the ones at Fullerton, but for the most part, the vast majority of the carvings that were on these rocks are gone. Um, and the carvings now survive in certain areas, which are which are some of the ones I'm talking about. So this is another picture of that diversity rocks area. What you can kind of see if you look is there's a lot of, there was tremendous amount of writing on these rocks. That one on the left hand, lower left hand corner is an extract from Walt Whitman. You can see there was a painting sort of in the center there. Um, you know, there were a lot of messages, there were lots of messages, political, cultural, social on these rocks. Um, but again, they're all most mostly they're gone, but a few things survived. There's a handful of paintings. This lovely skull and crossbones survived. Uh, and it's on this bigger rock that's got all this stuff going on. It's got a flag, O Sola Mio, a sort of a sun, drink only to me, only with thine eyes. You, so you can still see this rock uh, north of diversity. And, and, and a few other carvings and a few other paintings that are there, but most of the paintings are gone. Like this, you know, nice sort of abstract spiral. These are three different paintings. You can see the sort of the social message that was in a lot of these paintings. These are all gone. Of course, paintings fade anyway. So paintings don't last like the carvings do. This is a, a, an image from Foster Avenue Beach in 2006. This is one of my favorite paintings there it says the real mickey is retired and living in miami and if you look you can see he's on a kind of a deck chair under an umbrella he has got his walker and he's very emaciated uh that painting is almost gone though you can just barely see it if you know it's there it's faded away this is a drunk mickey um this had faded away but in 2018 someone actually repainted uh this particular mickey which is near the retired mickey you know this one is almost, this one's pretty much faded away to nothing, but, uh, you know, a nice Charlie Brown from 2002, presumably. This is Foster, that Foster Beach area, and you can kind of see how painted it was, and most of these paintings are faded away. You can also see just in passing, you can see how the sand goes all the way out past that metal structure, and there's the same view in 2019. Uh, you can see how high the lake has risen, so just what it's worth. Another Foster, another painting in that same area, painted in 1999 and restored in 2016 by the original artist. Um, these are uh, basically, there, there's these fantasy elements, but they're basically tributes to dead guitar players. So there's Jimi Hendrix uh, is in blue. Next to him with that red guitar is Frank Zappa. On the far left is Muddy Waters. But to give you an idea of how fast these paintings can fade, this is Muddy Waters just two years after he was repainted in 2018, already kind of starting to disappear. But you can still see this painting there. It's just, you know, in bad condition. But people are still doing things on the lake. So just as an example, um, th th these were, this is a chalk drawing on the left and actually a painting on the right. The painting was executed last week, literally by an artist named Tyler, who, who I saw work walking in chalk, but then he came back at some point. The chalk paintings, unfortunately, get washed away, but he came back and painted that like really nice moon face. So that's at Foster Beach and it's brand new. So stuff's still going on, but of course, many of these carvings are much older. And the earliest date that I've been able to find is June, 1930. 
Uh, this is in Hyde Park, which would have been not, not long after these stones were laid out. This is in at around 49th Street in that Morgan Shoal area. And there's a number of carvings that you know, have 1931, 1932 dates um, scattered around. Um, that Morgan Shoal area happens to have some really great carvings. This is one of the best surviving carvings along the lake, this, this wing skull with Frank underneath it. I mean, the typography on Frank alone is fabulous, but then you have this great image that you usually only see on tombstones in colonial or Puritan cemeteries, but you've got Frank, another bathing beauty. Uh, these are all in that Morgan Shoal area. So a nice seated bathing beauty. Someone carved a fully functional checkerboard, which presumably was used at one point, but this Morgan Shoal area is a mess. Here's a carving. And if you look carefully, you can see there are some carvings on that rock out in the lake, but that's the problem is this area has been extremely deteriorated. Uh, and is really beat up. And, and a lot of these carvings are very hard to get to. Um, and this one's very nice. I mean, there's a, there, there you can see on the left uh, that carving, which is actually upside down, but right side up, it has this interesting sort of religious message about the God and host of our forefathers was here. Um, but it's hard to get to and see that one. Uh, that whole area is threatened. These are more, we saw the Christ and that rock earlier on. Um, and, and this sort of 49th Street Beach area. This is threatened, there's been significant flooding and there were emergency measures that the city took last year to sort of stop the flooding and the erosion, but the city is actually actively proceeding with plans to expand the parkland there at Morgan Shoal, uh, at, you know, extend it out into the lake, um, which would be a nice thing for Hyde Park. Uh, there's no telling if there will be any effort to preserve the carvings, although I'm doing my best to make sure it gets on the agenda for the city. Um, for what it's worth, uh, this is near Morgan Shoal. Um, this, this was uh, something I just photographed today, actually, which is um, a rock that used to be on the lakefront was moved inland between Morgan Shoal and that Oakwood Beach. This is probably, you know, 44th Street or something right near the lake. But you can see this has got a whole bunch of faces carved on it. It's got a tree. Um, these carvings, I'm pretty sure, were made in the last 20 years or so. These are not as old as most of the other carvings, but it's just nice to see someone doing something that elaborate. Uh, there's no name on it, or, or if there is a name, it's it, it's unreadable. Uh, but you know, there there have been some fairly recent carvings, uh, although carving activity in general is 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 not what it used to be. This is a, another image of Promontory Point, which is a, right across from the Museum of Science and Industry. It's a really beautiful spot if you ever get a chance to go there. Um, it was originally part of this project where they removed much of the limestone um, and they were gonna do the same at Promontory Point and strip all that limestone you see away and replace it with concrete and steel. That was the Army Corps plan, uh, but the community uh, mobilized in the early 2000s and with actually uh, then Senator Barack Obama's help they were able to stop that project and, and preserve um, the rocks. Now, Promontory Point needs help because particularly on the other side, this is the south side. On the north side, the rocks are not in great shape. Um, and along with this process to, 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 to the city's moving ahead with it, Morgan Shoal, they're also restarting planning to rebuild Promontory Point. And it's not clear whether, whether uh, the city's intentions are any different than they were uh, in the early 2000s in terms of removing the limestone. So uh, that's something to watch. But uh, there are beautiful carvings that are worth saving there, like, like these three, the fleur-de-lis, and then there's two leaves next to it. These, this is a relatively older picture. These are a little more faded today. This is one of my favorite sort of goofy ones. Here Adolf lies, as usual, someone presumably at it, and then in Vamp 79th Street. So this is massive. This is probably eight feet wide. Um, and on top of it, though, is this. It says, this is Susie's tomb. You know, you can see at the top of it, Susie's face, and at the bottom, Susie's feet. And then this other image on the lower right just kind of puts it in context. So, you know, people sort of adding on to each other's work uh, to make them interesting. There are a lot of these bathing beauties at, at Promontory Point, particularly on sort of the south um, west side. There used to be, a, a after World War II, there was a radar facility for Nike missiles on the point. So there were soldier, there were sailors, I believe, I think they were, I think it was Navy, stationed there. Um, so I suspect that may be where some of these bathing beauties come from, like this sort of Betty Grable style figure. Uh, 
uh, but there's a number of them. Some of them are pretty badly faded and hard to see. You know, there's a few portraits. These both seem to be American Indian, uh, portraits of American Indians. Um, that portrait on the right always struck me as especially soulful. An ace of spades and an unfinished Playboy bunny. And, you know, these symbols. And then in 2018, because I was photographing this before and after, someone came and did these lovely mosaics uh, on a rock at Promontory Point that, you know, they're still there and are quite nice. I mentioned La Rabita. There's the, there's the peace rock and there, there's that double heart. Um, someone carved this beautiful compass there. Uh, I have to say it's non-functional, but I think it's accurate in the directions. Um, then this rock has some names on it and then a ship. And you see a lot of that where a rock will have multiple different people carving multiple different things. So that's behind La Rabita Hospital, as are these. Al loves Clara, at least he did in 1967. Doc in Georgia in 1974. And this is across the uh, inlet to Jackson, the entry to Jackson Harbor uh, from La Rabita. So this is at the 63rd Street Beach. This particular carving is dated 2016. So again, there have been a few more recent ones. But a lot of the carvings are gone and I'm almost finished because I'm just going to run through these. These are examples of carvings that are lost, like that stunning bathing beauty at the lower left or the cavemen at the top there. Um, just, just really remarkable works of art that are, that are vanished other than except of these photos uh, that my friend Aaron Packer actually took uh, in the early 1990s, late 80s. These are all, those are mostly from around Montrose Harbor. These are also near Montrose Harbor. The one on the left seems pretty clearly to be from the 1930s. The one on the right dated 1977, but a very strong carving. Some more bathing beauties. Uh, the most anatomically correct bathing beauty I have, uh, or one of the most anyways I've come across, all gone. Uh, same location, gives you, this is my hands in there to give a sense of scale of this profile. Another profile, Bob, it's off screen, but it's, it's a Bob and is be wearing a beanie there. And then this large figure, which was uh, at that same area south of Montrose Harbor. Um, I love this figure because it's another case where someone started carving it. And whether it was the original artist or someone else, they kind of completed it with paint, with white paint, give the, the figure a hand and feet. Reminds me a little bit of this carving, which is from Sydney, Australia. And it's, it's believed to be about 5,000 years old. So an ancient Aboriginal carving, but probably similar in scale and uh, you know, similar intent. But that's, that's pretty much it. I, I will mention, uh, I will show you an image of the cover of my forthcoming book. And most of the carvings I just showed you and many more, more a lot more of the story are going to be in this forthcoming book, which is about to go to the printer. We should get it in the fall. Um, and if you want more information on that, you can go to my website, which is uh, on the screen and I think will be in the chat, interestingideas.com. I should also mention for, if you're really interested in the carvings, uh, the Edgewater Historical Society has, has, has sponsored a couple of walking tours of the carvings, um, and it has another one coming up in September. I think it's September 25th, 24th or 25th, uh, but you can get find more information uh, at, at uh, this, this link, uh, which uh, I will put in the chat. Um, and that's about it. So thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to... Uh, uh, take any questions. I will look. I will look in a minute and uh, okay. answer questions. What uh, I wanted to do was put this uh, URL in the chat, but I don't. I don't appear to be able to post to the chat. I can answer. I'll. I'll, I'll figure that out before we're done. So I'm just looking at the chat. So yeah, someone asked, "Can the carvings be dated?" I obviously covered that. Um, you know, a lot of them have dates and the dates really range all the way from that 1930 right up until that 2016 that I showed you. But but in between, you know, there were a lot there was a lot of activity in you know, in all those decades sort of through, I would say, the 1970s. Um, I think they taper off in the 1980s. You know, the problem now is, of course, when people are at the lake now, they don't have you know, carving tools in their hands, they have phones, <laughs> and they're a lot less likely to be inclined to carve, but um, uh, they still should, they, 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 there still may be a few carvings executed here and there, but the earliest, they can't be any older than the late 1920s, because that's when these rocks were put in place, um, and uh, 
you know, you can kind of date some of them by their patina, but they all get weathered. So, so in the end, they all kind of look old. Um, yeah. How, how long, so I think I might've addressed how long it takes the simple one. I mean, Bob Nacktree told me it took a few hours to carve his names. The mermaid took about a week. Um, you know, I think a peace symbol, you know, I got to think that would be an all day affair, but it depends on how good they are. You know, if, if it's a large carving and it's well done, it's going to take longer than, you know, simple ones. I think some of the initials that you see in names, probably someone just had their keys with them and they dug into the rock because limestone is soft enough to carve, which is why they're one of the reasons they're there. So someone said, yes, the Lakefront Preservation Project also saw old school. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, yeah. It's, I, I didn't know about the Laredo Taft piece, but I'm not, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, the guys, you know, the guys working out there, they're just, they're just out there to dig up what's there. And, you know, that's what they do. <laughs> Unless someone tells them not to. It's also, um, you know, more expensive to preserve these things. It's more expensive to preserve the limestone. The cheapest way to preserve the lakefront from erosion is just to dump big piles of rubble along the shoreline, which is what the Army Corps of Engineers was originally going to do for the length of the Chicago shoreline, other than the beaches, was to dump big piles of stone. And the city threw a fit in the 1980s and 90s, came up with a couple hundred million dollars, and they did that concrete and steel that I showed you instead, which again, from a historical or atmospheric point of view is, is kind of depressing, but it certainly allows access to the water and is a lot better than a big pile of uh, rubble. What happens to the records they're moved and not put somewhere? Yeah, you know, I think someone mentioned landfill. You know, I don't, I, I think some of them were repurposed. There, there, there's one section of the lakefront where they just did do that rubble pile. It's, it's a relatively short section, which is, um, if you know where Waveland Golf Course is, it's along there. But, you know, I think a lot of them were dumped. Um, I, I suspect some of them were dumped in, in Lake Michigan. Um, some might have been repurposed as ground into gravel. I don't know. Not surprisingly, you know, there's not a lot of people who want to talk about what they what happened to those rocks. Um, I've asked, and I've not really gotten a, a, a very clear answer. So it's a little bit of speculation. The rocks, by the way, I'm told by someone who was active in Hyde Park with Promontory Point, he told me that the rocks, the, these limestone rocks came from Indiana quarries, which I'm sure is true. I mean, I got confirmation of that. But he told me the interesting trivia he told me is that they came from the same quarries that were providing limestone for buildings like the Empire State Building, and that these were the rejects, the ones that, that, that had flaws that made them unsuitable for architecture use. But of course, they were fine for lining, lining the lakefront. Um, so it's an interesting point. So to the... Uh, the person who's in Florida, I'm just going to type the answer, which is going to be uh, that, you know, I guess I can't. All right. Let's see. I was trying to type this. Uh, I, I don't seem to have access to the chat, so I can't. I was going to copy this URL, but I don't seem able to copy it. To, to, well, why don't you tell me and I'll type it into the chat? Uh, oh, because it's a nasty. It, it, it actually okay. has. Uh, what I'll do. Let me uh, I'll email it to you real quick. And because uh, it's, it's got some code in it. So I don't want to have to tell you. All right. I just emailed it if you can without a subject. So you can if you can pick that up. OK, thank um, you. Yep. Um, anyways, that's for the Edgewater Historical Society. If you are interested in, in getting up close and personal, um, you know, someone asked about Northwestern and Evanston. You know, I, I certainly walked. I, I walked the beaches in Evanston. And, and in a few other places outside of Chicago. And, and you know, Northwestern has its own interesting uh, paintings on the rocks, which I think are great. Um, but there's not really, I, I've not been able to find carvings like this um, uh, north of Chicago. Um, you know, I've looked in a few other places, you know, like I looked in Sheboygan <laughs> to see. Uh, uh, and I've not found carvings like these. You know, there's sort of a magic, you know, set of fat combination of factors. You have to have people hanging out. They have to be relatively private because although I don't think the police care, a lot of people think the police care and, and would not make carvings in an exposed area because they think they might get in trouble. That Tyler I mentioned who did the chalk drawings and the painting, 
he, I, he ac I actually saw him doing chalk drawings and he said he would use painting norm paint normally, but he was afraid of, you know, getting in trouble. And I kind of encouraged him to use the paint. I mean, I didn't guarantee him the police wouldn't care, but I said, I didn't think they would care. And, you know, later a week later, he did do the painting. So, but I think people are a little daunted. So it has to be, you know, somewhat out of the way, I think, uh, at least of where the authorities are, but, but no, in North, you know, as I say, I've looked at, at Northwestern and, you know, I love the painting there. And in fact, in Chicago, along Loyola beach, there's, there's sanctioned paintings on a, on a line, a very long line of, uh, of a, like a concrete wall there that they refresh, I think every year. Uh, but but um, the carvings are pretty, uh, as I say, as far as I know, are unique in terms of modern, you know, something done in modern times at, at this scale. I mean, there are seriously, even today after half of those rocks have been removed, there's still thousands, I've still photographed thousands of different rocks with carvings on them over the last few years. So there's a lot of carvings. A lot of them are, are just initials and names. They're not all those fabulous portraits and all the rest, but there are a lot of portraits and all the rest too. Well, I hope you keep patrolling for new additions. Yeah, I will. I, I keep looking. And I have to say, they, these can be hard to see, so hard that even, even around Foster Beach, I live near there. I walk my dog there a couple times a week. I look for, I've been looking for carvings there on a weekly basis for years. And in the last year, I found a couple of carvings I had not noticed before. So um, they, they can be hard to see. A lot depends on the sunlight. If you really want to look at the carvings, you got to get up very early when the sun is coming in sort of straight off the lake. Because uh, in full sun, they, they kind of lose definition. So just, just a, a word of advice if you want to uh, be a, a, an archaeologist and track these things down. Thank you so much. I, I, do we have any? Uh, we, I don't think we have any more questions. I, I, I want to mention to everyone that, that there is a link to that Edgewater um, walking tour in the chat um, now. So if you want to copy that down before we go away, it like Bill said, it's kind of long. It's oh, I see my problem. I was looking at the Q of A, Q and A uh, okay. at the chat. All right. Well, it's in there, but it, I'm sure if you just go to edgewaterhistory.org, yeah. you would be able to navigate your way to um, the tour as well, um, in case you don't have something to write that long address with. But um, thank you so much. This was really interesting. I think we'll all look at the lakefront a little differently from now on. Well, you're welcome. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Enjoy. You know, next time you're at least, you know, Foster Beach isn't that far from Glencoe. It's worth, uh, you know, a straight shot down Sheridan and, and uh, you know, check it out. There are carvings north of Foster Beach and south of Foster Beach. I mean, and it, it, you'll be rewarded if you, and it's a nice place, you know, in general. So highly recommend it. Thank you so much for, for letting me talk. I love talking about them. And so I appreciate the opportunity. We'll also be getting a copy of um, Mr. Swissell's book um, when it's published in the fall. So um, come to the library and check it out if you like. So thank you very much and uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>